Hey, this is Colin Weeb from Gianovis Media, and I'm here with Gabriel Napora. And the purpose of this video is just to have a short conversation with Gabriel and tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing at GNM and a little bit about your background. So, uh, Gabriel, where, where are you from originally, and how'd you get in the film business? I'm originally from uh, Edmonton, Alberta. And my story of getting in the film business is um, I started taking a business management course at a college in Edmonton. And after that course, I got into sales and I was selling very high-end security alarms for a summer. Wow. And I didn't sell a single alarm, so I unfortunately failed miserably. But the school I had gone to uh, also had a film program and they posted auditions for actors to uh, act in one of their productions. So I auditioned and I got the part. And I didn't enjoy the acting, but I really loved the behind the scenes uh, of, of the jobs people were doing. I took two more years of film production at that same college, uh, did a practicum, which is a four month unpaid work term with a production company, a commercial production company, and I became a producer right after that. So I've been producing different things, commercials, music videos and films since the age of 23. So and now you do have a real back catalogue of music videos. I have a real back catalogue of music videos. What were videos. some of the big stars or the big songs that you worked on? Uh, Canadian wise we did uh, Biff Naked videos, Matthew Good videos, Swollen Member videos. Uh, we did a uh, Sarah Basai video which was the number one video in the States. Uh, so many country artists, Aaron Perchett. Wow. Um, hundreds and hundreds of videos. I mean, we were the main music video company in, in uh, Western Canada for a lot of years, yeah. Wow, yeah. so how did you make the shift into motion pictures, feature films, shorts, documentaries, that kind of stuff? Well, what had, what had sort of happened with that is I met uh, Tim Marlowe, who's also uh, part of the company, and we decided to do a movie together. And uh, Tim was part of the financing side, and I was part of the producing side. Uh, and we worked together on it and you know since then we've just been working on a bunch of different stuff and, and one of the other things that you know I've done a lot of as well is I've done a lot of like short films and what's called proof of concepts too. What, uh, explain to us what a proof of concept is, what is that? Sure, so right now what happens uh, a lot with Hollywood studios is they're run by some very young people who don't like to read as much. Used to be you could get a script in front of an executive uh, at a studio and they would consider it based on the merits of the script. Those days are gone, more or less. So what you have to do now is you have to show the executives at these studios what the film is going to look like before the film is even produced. So what you do is you produce you know, a two to three minute, you know, up to 10 minute short film. Would this be like a trailer or no? It could be a trailer, it could be a short film, it could be a series of scenes that shows the studio executives how the film is going to look and why this film is going to be compelling. And that is how studios are buying now. Wow. Now you have relationships with some pretty major studios. How I did do. that come about? A lot of it just came about through the proof of concepts that I produce. Um, a lot of the stuff I do has heavy visual effects to it. I started the career of uh, film director Neil Blomkamp before District, long before District 9. We were doing music videos and short films and proof of concepts together and uh, developed a love of visual effects at that point. Um, and from there just kept doing you know, projects that have a lot of visual effects and started doing these proof of concepts and marrying them with like screenplays and then going and selling them to studios, financiers, you know, a any place that finances projects. District 9 was quite a, an amazing feat at the time when it came out. That was really different. District 9 was uh, amazing and I think, you know, in terms of talent level, Neil is uh, he's a world, world-class talent. I mean, he's one of the, one of the bi biggest and best directors in the world. Now, you're no slouch in that area either. You, you invented the original, what became Chappie, is that correct? Well, uh, I produced with Neil uh, a proof of concept called Tetravale, which later became Chappie. Okay. Yeah. And for those who don't know what Chappie is? Chappie's uh, a major uh, feature that uh, Neil Blomkamp directed. It was put out by Sony. Uh, it was the number one film in the world as of the, the at this point in the interview about a month ago. Wow. Yeah. That's powerful. So yeah. which do you enjoy more, doing the proof of concepts or actually doing the full full on Features. feature film? Um, I actually love them both. The thing I love about proof of concepts is 
oftentimes my, you know, sometimes my ideas will make their way into the proof of concepts and that's a lot of fun. And it's a lot of fun executing a lot of them at once. Um, in terms of the features, I love being on set. I love, you know, being part of that whole process and producing. Um, they, they both have their great merits, I think. What's it like to work with the A-list actors and actually have to tell them what to do? A-list actors are actually, they, they tend to be great to work with. I mean, almost all, the interesting thing about Hollywood, and this is a little bit of a secret, is like the A-list actors are really easy to work with. It's kind of like, you know, some of the C-list actors that tend to be a little bit more difficult. And, and I'm not suggesting, you know, who I've worked with is C-list, but okay. there's, there's been a few challenging people. It's, uh, we find that in the music world too. Right. Same Sometimes thing. it's easier to work with some people than others and, and uh, less stressful. Right, yes, that's it. We all have personalities. So let's get back to why we're talking today. Mm -hmm. Genovis Media is, it's a new company, but yeah. it's got some people that have a track record. Yeah. Uh, Tim Marlowe's won an Academy Award. Absolutely. And that's, uh, that opens a lot of doors. It does. What, what is it like to be working with somebody who's had those accolades? And, and what does that mean to people that are involved in his camp, like yourself? Well, I, I think Tim's an amazing guy. And one funny story, actually, about Tim is uh, a few years ago, Tim came to me with that project that won an Academy Award. And he said, you should invest in this. You know, throw, throw some money in. It's going to win an Academy Award. And I, at the time, I was kind of like, come on, I'm, I'm a f film producer. I'm not a documentary producer. So, you know, why am I going to do that? And of course, inevitably, it does win the Academy Award. And, you know, Tim is one up on me in terms of Academy Awards and an and amazingly talented person. Now so, it's your turn. <laughs> I, hey, I hope at some point, but, you know, regardless, I'm always happy to see Tim do well. And he's a brilliant guy and a, a real asset to the company, undeniably. So in terms of today's landscape, I mean, I know right now, you know, uh, my daughters will sit and, and binge watch yep. uh, Grey's Anatomy, and I've been known to stay up late and watch House of Cards over sure. and over till the, till the series ends, and people are doing that now. There seems yep. to be this insatiable hunger for content. Yes. What's, what's the take from your side of the table? I know I've written in part of the website copy that, you know, studios are are in fear a little bit that they're not going to have enough content to mm -hmm. satisfy this, especially with China coming on. From behind the scenes, give us an insight as to what that looks like and why GNM as a content engine has a real opportunity here. Sure. Well, my opinion on it is this is probably one of the most exciting times in history to be a filmmaker or financier or anything like that. And the reason is there are more... Um, needs for content now than ever before between broadcasters networks studios the web you know everything that's channels kind of coming like online crazy. oh channels like crazy mm -hmm. almost every day there's some new uh company or network or something that comes online that requires content and the opportunities for that are unheralded i mean i don't think there's ever been this opportunity in history does this dilute the uh, revenue that's coming in from these or does it increase the revenue well, I think what it does more than anything is it gives, it gives just more opportunity. It doesn't dilute the revenue because, I mean, if you look at television, for instance, uh, networks are still paying very close to the same amount they've been paying for TV series. But mm -hmm. it does present an opportunity for companies with lower overhead that are hungry and, and can get things done on the more budget conscious mm -hmm. side of things to produce content at a reasonable price and profit immensely from that content versus the old way of doing things. So we have an amazing array of channels and distribution overseas, uh, other countries, uh, different yeah. places that will buy this content, lease this content, yes. license, license this. It, yeah. So as a content producer, mm -hmm. um, how much content do you think we can produce within, you know, a year? As, and, and what does that look like to you? What would be the ultimate? Well, I, I think if you look at, you know, some of the very successful producers who have come out of, like, Vancouver or L.A., I mean, the sky is really the limit. You know, there's, there's, there's guys certainly in L.A. doing 20 to 30 movies a year, you wow. know, and doing some TV series. They're very, very prolific. I mean, obviously, it takes a little bit of time to ramp up there. Um, but as long as you're doing it in an intelligent way and, you know, you're doing your due diligence on what's going to sell and you do pre-sales and make sure investor money is very, very safe, mm -hmm. the amount of content you can produce, you just keep ramping it up.
people will buy. Tim mentioned that in the interview that I did with him uh, previously, and he was talking specifically about a lot of these films, or almost all of the films now, based on the model that we're using, mm -hmm. are researched and basically financed and paid for and almost in profit before you even turn a camera on. Yeah, oftentimes... How does that, how does that work? Well, oftentimes what happens, I mean, let's say you have a, uh, a budget of $3 million that you want to do on a particular film. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to search for an actor whose value will bring back, you know, four or five or six million and try and get them for part of that project. So let's say you find that actor and you get that actor for a reasonable price. You then take that film and you go and pre-sell it pre -sell. to networks, broadcasters, uh, you know, distributors, studios. The sky's the limit as to who you can sell that to. And you know, before you, you even, you know, shoot a frame, oftentimes, uh, with tax credits and all the, the different financing options, you're actually in profit before you shoot anything. You know, alleviating uh, virtually all risk, if not all risk, to investors. And that's the model that we're following, and that's one of the reasons that we're talking here today, is to educate some of the supporters, some of our shareholders, and the people that are interested in following this journey as to exactly how we're going to build this company step by step. So one of the things that we've been talking about is these short films, mm -hmm. and um, let's talk a little bit about that from your perspective, sure. and we're, we're going to... Um, we're going to use this opportunity now to, to sort of set this up uh, in a way that will educate people to understand what the value of these films is going to, to be for this company. Sure. Um, traditionally in the past, and, and the way I came up in the film world, is there was this idea that, you know, if you did a short film, it was like throwing away money. You know, you're just lighting money on fire and it goes away. At this point though, you have to do short films. Mm -hmm. And there's several reasons why you have to do short films. And, and proof of concepts. When I say short films, I'm also talking about proof of concepts in there. The, the, the first reason is that is how things are getting sold now, especially mm -hmm. in the genres of like science fiction and horror and anything visual, that, even comedy. That is how projects are getting sold. So a proof of concept will take you farther than a script than a pitch than anything else. And I can say that firsthand having dealt with virtually every studio. The second reason you want to shoot short films now is there's a, a lot of film festivals and the Oscars and you, you know you look at Tim's Oscar for mm -hmm. best short form documentary. The chances of getting a major award in those areas probably supersedes the feature film area at this point. And for a company like GeoNovus, getting that acclaim, getting that exposure, you know, getting the name out there is only going to be a positive thing. It's like free publicity to the rest of the world that you don't pay for. So short films also aid in that. And as well as that, the, the cool thing about short films now is you're developing talent with short films. So you may find the next Neil Blomkamp. You may find, you know, the next big director, the next big actor. And once you have that, you apply them to your feature films and you just grow in that way as well. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind putting these films together, the short films at the early stage, mm -hmm. like you said, is to maybe find new talent to maybe take a script that you've been sitting on for a while sure. that's really good. Uh, but it's to get into that category of the Academy Awards, yes. uh, which is a narrow category. Very narrow. Uh, Randy Bachman always used to say to me, I want to put out an accordion record because the same guy at the Grammys always wins <laughs> the accordion <laughs> Grammy. Brilliant. Same guy year after year. If, brilliant. So if you enter a category that's maybe not as crowded, right. you have a better chance. That's the um, idea. But plus, on this new cutting edge uh, model that mm -hmm. we're doing, um, these all become, they could become features, these shorts. Well, they, even, they, could, they could be a proof of concept. Absolutely. Well. Features or TV series or web series. And, and the really cool thing about this from a GeoNovus point of view is when you get one of these in front of like a studio or a, a broadcaster or a financier or whatever the case is, outside of the company, there's, there's a very good chance, you know, that a, you'll be able to sell the, the proof of concept for a decent amount of money. B, you're not necessarily going to have to finance the feature. The feature may be financed by the network, the studio, or whatever. And you ride the upside of that. You get the producer fees, you get the profit sharing, and all that kind of stuff. And the only money outlaid by GeoNovus 
is a very small amount for that proof of concept or that feature. There's no other risk. Whether the film makes money or not, it's irrelevant because you've already made your money. Mm -hmm. I think upside. we like the low risk uh, opportunities yeah. here. Low risk is good. So why a public company? Why is it important for yourself and Tim and some of the actors that you're, you're involved with? There's, you have quite a deep um, Rolodex or, or contact sure. list. And uh, we, we've seen some of the other major public companies do very well over time. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, we're in this special area of time where now, you know, Netflix is creating their own product and some of these other channels are creating their own um, made for their specific uh, streaming versions. Uh, there's, there's a lot of appetite for content now. Right. So why a public company and, and what attracted you to this to begin with? Well, I think the reasons for a public company is it just allows you to ramp up um, in a significantly faster way than a private company. Uh, I think it gives you access to uh, a market that as a, as a private uh, a company you may not have access to. The other things I like about it is, you know, especially working with, with GeoNovus, is there's a very strong ethic to it. You know, you have to report, you have to be honest, otherwise you get kicked off the exchange. I mean, they keep you very, very honest. Uh, especially on the exchange GeoNovus is on. Mm -hmm. And if you look at like uh, some of the very big companies that started out, like Lionsgate and you know some of those other studios, they started out in almost the identical way. Mm -hmm. So the idea of you know working with a people I like who have the same creative vision and potentially turning this into another Lionsgate is incredibly exciting for a filmmaker. It's a possibility. It is a possibility. And especially in these times, I see it. Um, it's, it's really exciting for a musician, for a filmmaker, yeah. for anybody in the, uh, the visual effects uh, arena because there are these opportunities mm -hmm. and there are these uh, incredible um, hungry consumers out there that just want content over and over again. That's right. And uh, it's our job as creative people and, and uh, visual people to, to bring those stories. And yep. that's one thing I love is stories. How important is a story to you when you're making a film? Well, I think it all comes down to story. You know, if I, if I look at areas that I've succeeded and, you know, even areas where I failed, if it wasn't a good story, no matter how many visual effects I put in, no matter how good I made it look, it turned out sort of vapid and hollow. Whereas if you start out with a good story, you know, and then you add in the visual effects and you add in just little pieces of things. It, it can be a magnificent film or short film or whatever it is. I mean, people only connect to story and character. What and are some of your favorite films? My favorite films would be Shawshank Redemption, um, Blade Runner, yeah. uh, Dark City, you know, American Beauty, and then, you know, some obscure stuff that people probably haven't heard of, too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, all, all stuff that's deeply rooted in like very strong stories and very strong characters and any visuals just enhance that. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm glad we've had this uh, opportunity to have a chat. Um, we don't want to keep people too long, but I think from the investor and the shareholder community, part of this, uh, this interview today was just to introduce you to Gabriel and get a bit of the vision of how a film is kind of made from the beginning and Tell us a little bit about the, the risk. Is mm -hmm. there a risk to, to the film, or are we kind of at a place in time now where we've, we've got that covered? Well, I think you would be remiss in saying, you know, with any investment, there is an element of risk. But if you do film the right way, the element of risk is greatly diminished, if not eliminated. So it's all about uh, how many pre-sales you can get, you know, what the actor's attachment are, what the distribution plan is. If all of that stuff is put into the right place, the risk is either, you know, incredibly small or non-existent. But with that said, the potential reward of film, I mean, I'm sure we've all heard it, you know, the small film that made millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I've seen that before with many friends as well. You know, you do it the right way and the potential is there to... So you'd start. have a two or three million dollar movie that could potentially make... You'd have a two or... I mean, I've seen, uh, you know, with, with certain movies, two to three million make a hundred million. And that's an anomaly. That's not, you know, that's not something that happens every day of the week. But it does happen. Mm -hmm. So the potential upside is that much greater than, you know, the, the, the typical investments out there. And if you reduce the risk, hey, it's also a very exciting investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just to be clear, a lot of the, uh, 
the investment in GNM is to keep the infrastructure going. Right. You actually have your own financiers for these movies. You have people that have come to the table over and over That's again right. that continue to back you and yes. continue to back the certain actors that you work with. Yes, as well as studios and networks and all that sort of stuff, yes. And so some of the studios that you have been working with lately are... Lionsgate, we have a film coming out with Lionsgate very, very shortly. We just did a deal with Warner Brothers on a project. There's a project with Paramount that's going to be announced shortly, which is a very, very big project. I wish I could talk about, but I can't talk about. So just small companies. Then. <laughs> just just little, little tiny companies, you know, as well as some stuff with Sony. So there's the opportunities with the studios, you know, the biggest guys out there are enormous. They, they're looking for the next big thing, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. Well, thanks, Gabe. Thank you, Colin. And uh, thank you for uh, checking in and watching this uh, little interview. Uh, please remember to join our VIP club. Just go and click and enter your email. And then anytime we have one of these videos or we have some important information or even some, some media news, we'll let you know. And uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>